We're going to look at words penned by the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 3. I think the Apostle Paul would agree with the sentiments of that song, um, especially in light of what we're about to read. Uh, Romans chapter 3, I'm going to begin at verse 9, and we'll go through about verse 24 or so. If you can, would you stand as I read God's word? What shall we conclude then? Are we any better? Not at all. We've already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. <coughs> Excuse me. In the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world be held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. But... Now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. Lord, your word is powerful. And we need your word in our lives. We need your word, Lord. And we need to understand it. We need your Holy Spirit to apply it. And so, Lord, in these moments, do just that. We ask for insight, for wisdom, for clarity. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you were to ask me what my favorite movie of all time is, I don't think I could answer that. I have lots of different movies that I love, depending upon the mood I'm in, I suppose. But if you were to ask me what the best movie is I have ever seen, I can answer that question. The best movie I have ever seen, in my humble, subjective opinion, is a movie entitled Amadeus. It is just incredibly well done with acting, the music score is incredible. The cinematography, the plot, everything about it is just, I can't imagine a movie ever being done any better. I'd suggest if you've never seen it that you see it. And if you have seen it, see it again. I must warn you that in the movie there are no car crashes. There are no superheroes, and there are sections of it that can get a little boring, and if you don't like classical music, you might not get all into that aspect of it, and there are some disturbing scenes, but it is a powerful movie, expressing a powerful biblical truth. The movie concerns a man named Antonio Salieri. Salieri, as a young boy, loves music. And he, the passion of his heart is that he would grow up to become a composer who would compose beautiful music and thus 
be renowned in that field. And so he makes a deal with God. And he says, God, if you will grant this wish of mine, I will serve you with my whole life. I will be celibate and devote myself only to you and my music. And I will use the gift you give me to glorify you all my life. Salieri does grow up and becomes a renowned composer, one who is loved and respected. He ends up in Vienna, which was sort of the, uh, the capital of the music industry, as it were, at that particular time. He held a very important post, was very influential. And he says, everything in my life was wonderful, just the way I wanted it to be, until a young man named Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart shows up. And as he's portrayed in the movie, Mozart is rude, crude, immature, ill-mannered, by his own admission, a profane man. And he comes to Vienna as a man who embodied all of the characteristics that Salieri hated. As totally opposite of Salieri as you can possibly get. Salieri dedicated his life to living God's way. Mozart shows up. And he's the complete antithesis of that. Then Salieri listens to Mozart's music. And he realizes that Mozart's music far surpasses his in beauty and intricacy in every single way. That Mozart's music is truly miraculous. That Mozart has a gift that Salieri does not have, a gift that could come only from God to make music that Salieri could never dream of making. As Salieri says, all God gave me was the ability to appreciate it. And the fact that God gave this great gift to a man Salieri calls a vile creature, and not to himself, who had been a pious man throughout his life, this fills Salieri with anger and hatred. Anger and hatred toward Mozart, yes, but really anger and hatred toward God. That God would entrust this gift of music to a man like Mozart when Salieri has lived his entire life dedicated to God and did not receive a gift of this magnitude. And it ultimately drives Salieri insane. The movie's called Amadeus, not just because that's Mozart's middle name. The word Amadeus literally means loved by God or God's beloved. It's an ironic title. Which one was beloved? Salieri, who did everything right? Mozart, who did everything wrong, and yet God blessed with this awesome gift. That's the question that the movie raises. For Salieri, it was unfair. God should reward the good people. He shouldn't reward the bad people. In Salieri's mind, he should have rewarded me, not Mozart. I've done things right. I've been worshipful. I've been uh, kept my promise, my vows to God. It's not fair that I didn't get it, and he did. Now be honest. Don't we all resonate with Salieri a little bit? In all honesty. Doesn't that somehow resonate with our sense of what should be fair and just? Shouldn't the good people get the good stuff? Shouldn't the bad people receive the bad stuff? I mean, somewhere in us, doesn't that resonate? You should get what you deserve in life. 
both positively and negatively. When things go wrong in our lives, how often do we think, well, what did I do to deserve this? And if something wonderful happens to somebody else, what do we think to ourselves, I wonder what they did to deserve that blessing. Somehow or other, in our thinking, it just seems universal in humankind that we have this, this sense of fairness that says good should be rewarded, bad should be punished. It shouldn't be the other way around. Something's wrong here, and that's what Salieri was dealing with in the movie. I'm going to talk this morning about grace. And grace, if you think about it, is unfair, according to that definition. Grace is unfair. We'll flesh that out in a minute. This month, we're celebrating 500 years of the beginning of the Reformation, and we're looking at some of the theological underpinnings of that movement that continue to resonate and reverberate today. We're looking at them in terms of these five solas, which means alone or only in Latin. Five basic things that were the foundation of Reformation thinking. We've already looked at two. We looked at sola scriptura, which means scripture alone. That will be our basis and our guide for everything. Last week, we looked at sola fide, faith alone, as opposed to works. Today, we look at sola gratia, grace alone. What does that mean? Well, in the words of a song by Graham Kendrick, only by grace can we enter. Only by grace can we stand. Not by our human endeavor, but by the blood of the Lamb. Sola gratia, grace alone. Now, what is grace? Well, the traditional answer to the question, what is grace, is it's unmerited favor. Grace is what happens when God gives us what we do not deserve. That God blesses us with good gifts that we do not earn. Ray Pritchard, an author, wrote that it's not just unmerited favor, it's contrary to merited favor. We merit something else, but God gives us good anyway. That's what grace is. Grace is just counterintuitive. It goes against our logic about how things should be done. Good should be rewarded. Bad should be cursed. Grace is the concept that in our badness, God still blesses us. It's not fair. But I've never heard a Christian ever complain that it's not fair. Because we're on the receiving end of that deal, aren't we? That God graces us and gives us what we do not deserve. It is the clear teaching of Scripture that that the Reformers in the 16th century rediscovered. They didn't invent it. It just had gotten covered up and pushed aside and forgotten in, large, uh, in a large way. But they rediscovered it. And it has a tendency to get lost. And it has a tendency to get lost even among the religious, even among the churchgoers, even among people like us. It's so easy to fall into the trap of works and forget grace. It's so easy to fall into the trap of thinking that somehow we have merited what God gives us when the fact remains it's all grace. It's all unmerited. For some reason, we love works more than grace, and that makes no sense at all. And yet we have the tendency to go down that road, maybe because grace is so counterintuitive goes against the grain of how we normally think in most other spheres of life. 
you should get what you deserve. But when it comes to God, aren't you glad we don't get what we deserve? That's grace. There's two theological foundations of grace, two things you have to understand in order to understand that what grace is. The first is that we as human beings are sinful and helpless to change. Did you notice when we read in Romans 3 what he says? There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. And if we don't get the idea later on in the chapter, it says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is no wiggle room there, folks. Every single one of us fit into that category. We are sinners. We are unholy and God is holy. And in Romans 3.20, we hear the verdict. Therefore, No one will be declared righteous in God's sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. No matter how hard we try, we're still falling short of the glory of God. In short, we're in a pickle. We're not righteous in God's sight. God is a just God. We can't be righteous enough. The second theological foundation is this. God does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. So clearly stated in verse 24, we are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. By his grace. It cannot be any clearer than that. How are we saved? By grace. His grace in no other way. Our salvation depends entirely on the fact that God has offered it to us and done the work through Jesus Christ. And last week we saw the way that is appropriated, that gift is received, is by faith and faith alone. That's the gospel. That's the truth of God's word. Only by grace. What a marvelous truth. What an amazing truth, to use that word again. That's the marvelous song that we sing. It's a song of God's grace. What makes it amazing? Why is it so important? Well, obviously, the quick answer is, well, eternity lies in the balance. Can't get more important than that. But I want us to also see what difference it makes day to day in our lives. Knowing that we have been saved by grace. Knowing that it's God's gift. Knowing that we did not earn it or merit it, but a loving God made it available to us and we've appropriated it by faith. It does two things for us. First, it frees us. Grace frees us from doubt. If there's a question I get more often than this, I'm not sure what it is. I'm not sure that I'm really saved. I'm not sure that I'm going to go to heaven if I were to die this moment. I'm not sure I'm really a child of God. And usually that's phrased in a way of, I'm not sure I'm good enough. I mean, yeah, I... I, 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 I made a decision once upon a time and walked an aisle or was baptized or read a prayer or something, but but I I, I still don't really live the way I'm supposed to. And and how, how do I deal with that? If you understand that salvation is by grace, that's the basis of our assurance. Because our salvation is not based on what we have done or not done. Our salvation is based on what Christ has done in his word that says, here it is. If you have accepted his gift of grace, you are his. We know we're not worthy, but it's got nothing to do with our unworthiness. It's got everything to do with what God says and what he has done and what he has promised. So our assurance 
is not in ourselves. Our assurance is in God and his grace. It frees us from doubt. It also frees us from guilt. For the gift of God is his forgiveness for everything we have done and will do wrong. And that we don't have to carry that guilt around with us anymore. I love the story I heard many years ago. R.C. Sproul told it. He said he was dealing with a uh, parishioner or, or somebody who was in that he knew came to him and said, Dr. Sproul, uh, I know what the Bible says about forgiveness, but I just don't feel forgiven. I mean, I've asked God, I've confessed my sins, I've come to Christ, I've, I've asked for forgiveness, but I just still feel guilty. I just, I just can't get rid of that guilt. And R.C. Sproul says, tell you what we're going to do. We're going to pray one more time. And she said, well, I've already prayed a number of times about this. I'm not sure one more time is going to do. He says, well, we're not going to ask God to forgive you for whatever that thing is. We're going to ask God to forgive you for your arrogance. She said, my what? And he said, well, does the Bible say you're forgiven or not? Yes, it does. Would God lie? No, he wouldn't lie. So basically what you're saying is you're placing your feelings above what God said. You're afraid you haven't been forgiven because you don't feel forgiven. Well, what did God say? Are you forgiven or not? How arrogant of you to think that you know better about this than what God has said. Now, I wouldn't be quite so blunt to say that to somebody. But you get the point. The grace frees us from guilt. Whether we feel it or not. It also frees us from pride. I'm a Christian and I'm pretty good. Does that ever creep into your mind? You look around at those who perhaps live an unholy lifestyle. Say, thank God I'm not that bad. Grace frees us from pride because we realize it's not about us. It's not about our goodness. There but for the grace of God go every single one of us. We are sinners saved by grace. Just like everyone else who has ever come to Christ. God didn't give us salvation because we are more worthy than others. God gives, offers salvation to everyone. And he led us to know about that and to accept it by faith. So it frees us from doubt and guilt and pride, but it does enough something else. Grace should motivate us. As writer John Sampson has said, the works we do are the fruit, not the root of our salvation. I like that. Works are the fruit, not the root. In other words, because we have been saved by grace, things will follow. What will follow? Well, grace motivates us to give thanks. Have you ever made a meal for yourself? Just yourself. You go in the kitchen, you get everything, you make whatever, you eat it, and it's really wonderful. At the end of that meal, do you ever say, thank you, me? You did a good job. Well, no, because, because I did that. Okay. But when somebody else does something nice, you're supposed to thank them, aren't you? If salvation is all on our own, then there's no reason to thank God. I did it. But if salvation is grace alone, all on Him, then He deserves... Thanks, does he not? Continually for all he has done. Grace motivates us to thank God. If you can think about God's grace and not thank God, then there's a problem somewhere. It should lead us directly to gratitude. How can it help but do that? It also motivates us to live righteously. We've been made righteous in God's sight. So it motivates us to live that way in our lives. It motivates us to serve in devotion. 
God has been so good to us. He has been so gracious to us. He has given us all of this. How can I not love Him and serve Him with my life? I love the words of Isaac Watts' hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. The last verse he says, Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Grace motivates us to serve in devotion. And grace does one more thing. It motivates us to tell others. Because grace is good news. It's the best thing that's ever happened to us. What do you do with good news? Keep it contained? Not tell anybody? Those of you who are on social media at all know that when you get good news, what do you do? You post something, right? This is good news. When we understand grace, it motivates us to tell others, to give testimony, to share what God has done for us. Because he's the one that did it, not us. Grace truly is amazing, isn't it? I guess that's the word for the day, amazing. And we need to always realize that, to remember it, to never let it become ordinary. When we think of grace, it should thrill us. It should not lead us to say, yeah, well, I've heard that before. I know that. Grace is amazing. There's no other way to put it. I think the only thing more amazing than grace is to reject it. Why would you reject it? Why would you shove it aside? God treating us better than we deserve. In mercy, not giving us the condemnation that we deserve. But in grace, giving us the salvation that he achieved that we have not deserved. That's the message of the Bible. That's the gospel. In the words of the old hymn, Rock of Ages, Not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's commands. Could my zeal no respite know, could my tears forever flow. All for sin could not atone, thou must save, and thou alone. Nothing in my hand I bring, Simply to the cross I cling. Naked, come to thee for dress. Helpless, look to thee for grace. Grace alone. Praise God. It truly is amazing. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord for this amazing gift that you are unfair in the way we generally look at things. That you break in to our situation which was hopeless because of our sins and make a way out for us. Lord, thank you for your grace. And if there's any here this morning who have not experienced that, who have not accepted it by faith, I will pray, Lord, that you would be touching them that they would do that even now. And for those who have, Lord, we thank you. And as we think about grace, may it truly free us and motivate us in the way that we live our lives. We cannot thank you enough, Lord, for grace. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.